Hi guys, so welcome to the first lecture of Galactic Dynamics lecture series. So in this lecture, I'll be throwing in some numbers just so that uh, we realize the situation that how our galaxy in particular looks like, how many stars it has, uh, what's the velocity of the stars typically and stuff like that. Plus, I'll also be talking about certain assumptions and approximations, the basic assumptions and approximations that are made while studying galaxy as a whole because galaxies though it consists of stars it's not studied as individually for every star it's 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 a it's sort of a bulk dynamics which is ruled by mass distribution and the potential of the galaxy as a whole now making assumptions in any theory it's very important because because it really simplifies our life it simplifies the equation under study and most importantly uh, for example, if you have a given system and you make an assumption about that system and you proceed with your theory, with your calculations and you find out that your result matches with, with the actual observations of the system, this means that your theory is correct which basically means that your assumption in the beginning was correct which means that your intuition about the system was correct so it helps in uh, developing a better understanding of the system. Now, prerequisites for this lecture and the upcoming lectures would be that I'm assuming that you people know, have basic knowledge of coordinate systems. For example, we'll be dealing in spherical coordinates and cylindrical coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. So, I, so one should know the velocity conversion from one coordinate system to another, the position conversion from one coordinate system to another. Plus, I'll be assuming that all of us know basic classical mechanics like Lagrangian and Hamiltonian and canonical momenta and stuff like that, which is not required particularly in this and uh, for near future videos, but it will be important. The symbols that I'll be using are usual uh, phi, the Greek symbols. Uh, phi is for gravitational potential, rho is for the density distribution, etc. Okay, so let me begin. So our own Milky Way consists of about 10 to the power 11 visible stars that our telescopes can catch and the gas that it has is about 10 to the power 10 solar masses. So this M dot right here, it's a symbol of solar mass which is equal to the mass of the sun uh, which is which sits in our own solar system. Now the gas, uh, it's uh, it doesn't uh, the majority of the galaxy it's it's stars and it's dark matter and gas uh, doesn't really uh, play any major role in the dynamics of the galaxy but just to give you a number it's right here we won't be dealing with the with the gas dynamics moreover uh, in a galaxy though there are 10 to the power 11 stars or maybe more than that so you might say that there could be collision between stars but collisions are rare so we don't talk about collisions in stars uh, in the galaxy the collision between two stars uh, the collision between two stars in a galaxy are so rare that we really neglect it just to give you an approximate idea that why is it rare or why is it not physical to consider uh, collision between two, two stars here is a small uh, easy calculation so this mean free path lambda equals 1 over n sigma where n is the number density of the particles in a system and sigma is the cross section of the particles so mean free path it's the mean path uh, between any two particles in a given system it's by definition of mean free path so if we consider our own galaxy and let's make an assumption that all the stars resemble uh, our sun so all of them have r naught as their radius which is similar to the radius of the sun and m naught as mass of every star which is same as mass of the sun so if you make this assumption which means that there are 10 to the power 11 stars with this mass and with this radius so we can calculate the cross section using pi to r dot to the whole, whole square where r dot the radius of the sun is 7 into 10 to the power 10 centimeters moreover since we are consider considering 100 billion stars in our galaxy so if we consider our galaxy to be a perfect disk with a thickness of 1 kiloparsec 
and the radius of 10 kiloparsecs. So yes, we'll be talking about in kiloparsecs and not meters and centimeters. You can see the conversion here that one kiloparsecs equals 3 into 10 to the power 21 centimeters. Since galaxy is huge and distance between two galaxy is even even greater, so we'll be talking in kiloparsecs. So if we consider this, our galaxy of radius 10 kiloparsec and thickness 1 kiloparsec, this is the number density that it boils down to, provided 100 billion stars. So we get our mean free path using this formula as this. You can do this calculation. It's pretty much uh, an approximate uh, number. Now if we talk about interval between any two collision and average time between any two collision is given by lambda over v where v is the random velocity and lambda it's the mean free path so basically time equals distance upon velocity and the random velocity in our galaxy is near about 40 km per second so average random velocity of any star in our galaxy is 40 km per second so the time between collision of two stars is approximately 10 to the power 19 years now this time between any two collisions of a star on an average is much much greater than the age of the galaxy itself and the age of the galaxy is about 10 billion years so as you can see that the, the collision of time the, the collision time between any two stars it is 10 to the power 9 times greater than the age of the galaxy itself so it's it's not very physical for two stars to really collide but which they do but we don't consider it so now stars which means that the star motion is totally governed by the gravitation and not collision really so every star uh, pulls another star with some gravitational force and that's how the overall potential of the galaxy is developed now we all in in our lectures we'll be also talking about various galaxy models so there are galaxy there are spherical galaxy models there are cylindrical galaxy models there are even complex galaxy models but there are two characteristics which is uh, which we take into account or and it's a it's a characteristic to every galaxy model first is that we consider stationary galaxy model which means that the density is independent of time so the mass density at any given space point in the galaxy it's independent of time it doesn't change that means there is no i mean there is no space so or basically the stars they don't leave galaxy or there are no stars that come into the galaxy which in reality they might do but the fraction is so small that it hardly affects the overall dynamics of the galaxy so our mass distributions that we'll be talking about is time independent second our galaxy it's continuous so though we we have already said that there are 10 to the power 11 stars and since they don't collide we can consider them as mass points but even though having said that the the densities that we'll be talking about would be continuous and we'll be talking about continuous potentials as well since it's since uh, it's not physical to calculate potential at every star by summing up the potential because of the rest of the stars it's not really physical and this assumption that the potential and the mass distribution is continuous really gives us uh, what we really observe using our telescopes and simulations so it's a nice assumption also our since uh, a galaxy is a huge system and it's a bulk system every star uh, has an effect on a, on another star so it's a bulk they affect each other's motion there is a rotational curve like this i'll just talk about it in, in a second so this assumption is really nice so these two are the characteristics to every galaxy model that we'll be considering now let's talk about our own galaxy which is a disk galaxy so milky way it's a disk galaxy so here is a very bad diagram of that galaxy so our galaxy it's not perfectly disk but it's an exponentially decaying disk in the sense so if we consider ourselves in a in a cylindrical coordinate so this is r axis and this is z axis so this is the center of our galaxy it's an axial symmetric uh, mass distribution and hence axial symmetric potential distribution our sun sits right here about 8.5 kiloparsecs away from the center of the galaxy the stretch of the galaxy is about 25 kiloparsec its height over here sorry i haven't mentioned it's about 5 kiloparsecs i guess 
And this is how one would give the mass distribution of the galaxy in cylindrical coordinates in R and Z as rho naught, where rho naught is the, the density of the galaxy at the very center of the galaxy, times exponential minus R upon RD, where RD is the disk scale, the, the radius scale of our galaxy, which is characteristics to characteristic uh, value for every uh, galaxy. It's not constant for all the galaxies. Times the exponential minus Z over ZD, where ZD again is the Z scale of the galaxy. It sets the scale of the galaxy, basically that how far the galaxy is stretched in R direction and Z direction. That's what ZD and RD are. So it's a simple uh, mathematical formula and it's very helpful and it, it really approximates uh, our own galaxy. We'll also be talking about rotational curve. So this is a rotation curve with rotational velocities of stars in the disk on the y axis and on the x axis we have the radius, how far the stars are from the center of the galaxy. So our galaxy consists of disk uh, of visible stars. Our galaxy consists of gases also. Sorry, I haven't plotted the rotation curve of the gas. And our galaxy also consists of dark matter which resides in the halo. So this so this is the disk and this, the rest of the region right here, it's, it's called the halo of the galaxy. It's a fancy word. So our dark matter, it's in the halo. That's the road. So these are the independent rotation curve because of the disk. This is because of the halo. And this is how the total rotation curve of the galaxy looks like so so the visible stars uh, they have a potential of this sort g m over r where m is the total mass of all the stars combined the luminous matter of the galaxy upon r so since phi equals g m by r so does uh, the the the, uh, the circular velocity of stars if you remember the circular velocity it's given by r d phi by dr i'll be talking about uh, circular velocities in my next lecture. So the visible stars obey this potential uh, gravitational potential and the halo, the dark matter uh, at a very uh, uh, simple assumption follows log of radius. So we get a constant circular velocity curve and we get a sort of decaying and an inverse r velocity curve over here and this is the total curve of the galaxy so this discrepancy so this was the theoretical model that was proposed in 19 before 1950s and what was ob observed was this which is totally in contrast so this is what th the theory said because we had assumed that our galaxy consists of what we see so we had modeled 10 to the power 11 stars before 1950 and we had given a theoretical velocity rotation curve uh, for our own galaxy. But what our telescopes showed by the kinematics of stars what was this. So this discrepancy, this, this difference in the observed and in the theoretical model was accounted by the fact that our, that our galaxy doesn't consist only of visible stars but it also consists of dark matter which sits in the halo. We'll be talking about it more later. This is just an introductory lectures. Okay, that's it for now. Hope you had fun.